So who was the first missionary? First missionary? A lot of people would say, well, it was the Apostle Paul. I mean, he went out, he was sent out by God to the Gentiles. He, uh, he, his heart was for the, the nations that uh, did not know God. Apostle Paul, others would say, well, think a bit further about that. You know, on the day of Pentecost, it was Peter that got up and preached. And so in a very real way, and there were people from, albeit Jews, but there were people from every nation that were present on the day of Pentecost. Uh, you could argue Peter, you could argue Paul. And then people often would say, well, no, of course, Jesus was the first missionary. Uh, he was the one who came and he uh, took on flesh. He uh, dwelled among us. He, he was full of grace and mercy and taught the way of God, the kingdom of God, to announce the, king, uh, the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus was the real first missionary. Then sometimes people go, well, what about in the Old Testament? Were there any missionaries in the Old Testament? Eh, well, I suppose you could, you could definitely argue Jonah uh, could be considered the first missionary. Uh, you know, he didn't want to go. He was like the reluctant, the super reluctant missionary and how he got there and everything that happened to him and God used him in spite of himself, which is how God always does with missionaries, it seems. Uh, those are all good answers. But I'm going to leave the question hanging there for just a little bit. Who was the first missionary? Because I'd like us to think about how oftentimes, as we're thinking about missions in Scripture, that we make our missiology, which is the study of missions, come up out of one particular place, out of one particular focus, and that everything seems to grow up out of that. And that focus, uh, for most, would be the Great Commission, uh, the, uh, the text, of course, being Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And a lot of people would say, that's where missions comes from. That's, uh, that's what generates it all. That's where it came about. And go into all the world, preach the gospel, all the nations. The kind of thing you've been talking about here. The, taking the gospel to the peoples of the earth and allowing them to, uh, to know Christ and and to uh, respond accordingly. However, I'd like to do something a little different with how this is typically thought of and how that's centered on, it's not that this isn't an important text, it's a critically important text. It is kind of the summation of a lot of things that Jesus was saying to his disciples. But when it comes to looking at scripture and thinking about what does scripture actually say about missions, who was indeed the first missionary, I like to flip the triangle and flip it upside down and suggest the idea that in reality missions can be found in Scripture from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And that the Great Commission obviously fits into that, but when you look at the totality of what but the Bible says about missions and the heart of God and the desire of God for the peoples of the earth to know him and for redemption to take place and for redemption to happen. I think that the other uh, illustration is a little better. Turning the triangle upside down, thinking of it in terms of what does scripture really say about God's heart for the nations? Is this just something that came up late? I mean, if you take the Great Commission idea, it's like, uh, unfortunately, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but unfortunately, a lot of people have the idea of, well, yeah, the Great Commission happened right when Jesus is going back to heaven. It's like, uh, oh man, there's something else I got to tell you guys. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I know. Yeah, go out into all the world and preach the gospel because that will keep you busy until I get back. Unfortunately, and that's a terrible way of looking at scripture and thinking about it, but Honestly, I think a lot of people more or less consider it that way. It's like busy work that Jesus gave his disciples, something to, something to do. You know, my students love busy work. <laughs> no, they don't. I, I never did either. I hate busy work and I, hate assign, I never assign them busy work, I hope. Uh, the Great Commission is built out of, it's a logical summation of the heart of God and it's where the, the gospel must go, but it helps to go back and see the heart of God for the nations all the way back. And I mean all the way back. 
When you think about the first missionary and who that was, I think God himself is indeed the first missionary. Well, what, how can you say that? God, how is the Father God? He, he's up in heaven. How can he be the first missionary? Well, consider the beginning in Genesis and the Garden of Eden and the things that happened there. And just to push pause on the God being the first missionary idea and look even beyond that to why God did what he did, a lot of mission scholars point to the Sabbath day and the seventh day and how God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. Again, unfortunately, we put that, we transpose that into our realities and we go, yeah, I'd rest too. I'd be like really tired after creating the universe and I just need to rest. And I'm sure God had a big lazy boy or something, you know, that he, that's ridiculous. But the idea being that the rest of Genesis uh, 1, 2, and 3 and the creation process being in a, there was an expenditure of energy and hence rest. No, that's not the meaning of it. The meaning of rest, God didn't like get tired by creating the universe. That's crazy way to think. What happened was God did his work and he created a universe that was intended to be relational. Intended to be relational. He created a universe and then he waits for his universe to respond to him, his creation to respond to him. The creator waiting for the created to respond to the creation itself. And guess who leads in that process? Guess who gets the great privilege of being the, the overseers of that process? It is mankind self. We have the incredible privilege of unpacking the immensity of God and the nature of God and the creative genius of God in his creation through his world. And I believe that's exactly why we'll need eternity to do that, but that's a whole nother subject. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he allows us, <laughs> he calls on us, he designates us, he mandates us to lead in unpacking what that means and to respond to him in praise and in worship, in adoration, in being amazed and wondering at his creative genius and who he is. This is at the very root of what missions even is about in the first place. Missions isn't just some big task, you know, that God needs help with. Oh my goodness, he's got himself into a problem. He, and we've got to help him out somehow. Missions isn't just about me feeling fulfilled, you know, like, oh, I need to do this so that I can be like a happy person. Missions is about understanding what we were created to be in the first place and how he did that and why he did that. And he didn't have to do any of it. That's the most amazing piece of all in all of this. He didn't have to do this, but this is what he has chosen to do. And he asks us in. Man, the privilege of what it means to be a human being, what it means to be created for this. And in a lot of ways, the mission's task is a lot easier because this is hardwired into every human. It's there. We just have to find the way to communicate with it. Now, when you think back to the Garden of Eden and you know the whole process that took place there and the creation and, and the fall and Eve uh, listening to the serpent and the serpent challenging the goodness of God, the serpent challenging the righteousness of God, the serpent challenging the motives of God and putting that doubt in Eve's heart, the accuser doing his work as he does so incredibly well, and Eve succumbing to that and Adam along with her and the whole thing that went south from there. In the very next verses in Genesis chapter 3, it tells us a really interesting part of this. It goes to the answering my question, who was the first missionary? It talks about how in the cool of the day, God came and walked with Adam and Eve, you know, and I don't know what that means. <laughs> I just know that relationship was there and it was beautiful and it was as it was created to be it was it was really what we were created for and uh, they don't show up and you know par paraphrasing the story greatly but they don't show up and so God 
does an unusual thing for God. God asks a question. <laughs> Just think for half a second on this. God asks a question, and he asks a question. You know the question. Adam, where are you? Where'd you go? Where are you, Adam? Now, if we, if, it took me a while to do this, but if I think beyond the end of my nose, it's obvious that God doesn't lack the information. God's not ignorant as to Adam and Eve's whereabouts. God is, is asking a question not for his own benefit. This is much like Jesus did. He would ask questions. It wasn't like he didn't know the answer. He was engaging people. He was, it was a relational activity. And Ad, Adam is being asked the question by God, Adam, where are you? And God, by asking such a question, is demonstrating the fact that he desires to remedy the situation. In fact, there's a prophecy that happens there about crushing the serpent's head and bruising the man's heel and so forth. It points to the coming of Jesus eventually, but God is the first missionary. God goes and looks for Adam. He doesn't have to do that. He, it's not like it could have just been, okay, we're done. But it wasn't, and it's still not, because this is his nature. He desires, Missio Dei is about the redemption of mankind, and his heart is that that will take place. God goes and seeks out Adam. And in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, Genesis 1 through 11, in very simple terms, you have the fall, you have the flood, and you have the Tower of Babel, which some people would call the flop, just because they like alliterations. I, I, I kind of like that. You have the fall, the flood, and the flop, Genesis 1 through 11, the story of mankind. The story of mankind looking for significance, the story of mankind looking for a name, the story of mankind trying to figure things out on his own and God continually redeeming the process, but man seemingly not getting it, especially in the latter case of the, of the Tower of Babel and man seeking to, you know, become like God with neither the capacity nor the ability, of course, to do that, but yet seeking, as it says in scripture, a name for himself. And what all this does is it sets up what is to follow in Genesis chapter 12, which opens with the amazing words, related to Abraham and how God chose to bless Abraham. How God chose to come to Abraham, how God chose to speak to him the incredible words that, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Where do we first find the gospel? <laughs> find the first missionary in the Garden of Eden. Where do we first find the gospel? I would dare say that we first find the gospel in Genesis chapter 12. Through you, Abraham, all nations, all the people, the word is the same in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The word is the same, it's ethne. Through you, all the nations will be blessed. I'm going to do this. He does it in a way that God always does. God always blesses the few. He blesses the few so that they will bless the many. God blesses the few so that they will bless the many. This is exactly what he said to Abraham. I'm going to bless you, Abraham, and through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. This is my desire. Way back 2,200 years before Bethlehem, God is speaking his heart his missiological heart to Abraham. And this then becomes obvious in scripture. It becomes the setting, it becomes the, the model, it becomes the, the destination of God's grace as it arcs its way through scripture, pinnacles with Jesus coming for all of mankind and all of the hope that came before that and all of the faith that comes after that. And it ends up landing in Revelation chapter seven where indeed we see all the nations gathered worshiping the Father, where we see the fulfillment of what God said to Abraham all those thousands of years ago, 
when he said, through you all nations of the earth will be blessed and you don't even have any children. You don't even have any kids. In fact, it's not even possible. This is going to be my work. It's missiological in nature and God's heart is clearly seen in the Old Testament in many, many occasions. I think that one of the important things about what God is saying to Abraham, through you all the nations will be blessed, is how it differs from how humanity tends to think of themselves in terms of kingdoms, in terms of, of uh, ethnicities, in terms of, of nations, and how humanity tends to view itself in that way. Now, you know that all of humanity, virtually all of humanity, except a small subsection in very recent history of, of, uh, of those who, who choose to deny any kind of divinity, but virtually every, every corner of humanity acknowledges in some form or another divine, the divine and divinity and God, a God or God's theism of some, in some form or another. What happens though with our God, and God makes this quite clear in the Old Testament and even more clear in the New Testament, our God is not a tribal deity. I said, our God is not a tribal deity and he will resist any attempt to make him such. Our God is not a tribal deity. Why do I say that? Because in the cases of world religions, the world religions always conduct the believer in that religion back in the direction of the culture of the origin of that religion. Islam always will conduct you back in the direction of Arab culture. Hind being Hindu will always conduct you back in the direction of Indian culture. Being Buddhist will always conduct you back in the direction of Eastern Asian culture. And there are many other examples. This is what makes our faith so different. Our God is not a tribal deity. Our God is the Lord of the nations. He is Lord over all. And <laughs> The, the nature of what he does with the message of the gospel in every culture is to see the manifestation of that gospel within that culture in a contextualized manner that makes sense to that culture. And when we as missionaries transgress in that area, we do greatly err, but that's another subject. God's heart has always been for the nations. In Exodus chapter 19, verse six, Exodus chapter 19, verse six, Moses brings the people of Israel out to Sinai and you think, oh, this is where they're going to get the law, and it is, but the first thing God says to them is, now if you obey me and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession, and although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a nation of priests and a holy nation, or a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God is saying to his people, I want you to be like a nation of priests. You go, oh, you mean a nation with priests? No, he says a nation of priests. I want you to act on behalf of the nations. I want you to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. I want you to be a blessing to the nations. I want the nations of the world to see in your presence, in your community, what it means to have me as God, to have me as, as Lord, and what it means to serve me and what that looks like. This is my heart for you. God expresses that fact when he brings them even to the very place where they're going to receive the law. God expresses that fact on many other occasions in the Old Testament. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 8, 1 Kings chapter 8 where the temple is being dedicated by King Solomon. And King Solomon participated in the building of the temple and the creation of that beautiful place as a, as a center of worship of God. And Chapter 8 in 1 Kings is his prayer, his dedicatory prayer of that very place. And in the middle of that prayer, he says a very unusual thing. He says in verse 41, As for the foreigner, as for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for men will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this temple, then here's what we want you to do, God. We want you to nuke them. <laughs> We want you to destroy them because we know you hate them. Because you're a tribal deity, right? No, that's, that's not what Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, prayed. And this wasn't because it wasn't heart, God's heart. He says, when this foreigner comes and prays toward your temple, 
Then hear from heaven your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigner asks of you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people Israel and may know that this house I have built bears your name. This is a place where the foreigner should come and be able to pray and enter into the worship of God because God is the God of the nations. It doesn't say he has to become a Jew. It says he can come here and worship you. In other scriptures in the Old Testament, I'll just name them for you. Isaiah 49, God speaks through his prophet of how his desire for Israel is to be, as he puts it, a light to the Gentiles, a place where they, the world can see, the nations can see his greatness and what it means to live in community with him. In Isaiah chapter 56, a little bit later in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah he speaks of how God's house is to be a house of prayer for the nations. This is the very text that Jesus quotes when he's cleansing the temple and throwing the people out of the court of the Gentiles, the very place that, that Solomon spoke of as the place where they could come and pray, and yet they, the, uh, the Jews had filled it up with commerce and with all sorts of things and made it impossible for the Gentiles to come and worship. And Jesus becomes angry and he quotes from Isaiah 56 where he acknowledges the fact that God's heart is for the nations, for the peoples of the earth. I believe that that was a big part of the cleansing of the temple. And then Psalm 67, a beautiful psalm that speaks of the, the goodness of God and one that is often quoted. Sometimes I've quoted this to my children. I remember my mom used to quote this to me. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Make his, that your ways may be made known on earth and your salvation among all nations. That's Psalm 67, one. Psalm 67, 1, part A is often quoted, God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon you. Yes, I want the blessing of the Lord. It's the same Abraham blessing, you see. That blessing is designed to go beyond you, that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. God's heart is that the peoples of the earth know him. He said this a long time ago on many, many different occasions specifically seen in Abraham, specifically seen in the Garden of Eden, specifically seen through the prophet Isaiah and many other prophets who said the same thing as well. It should not have been a surprise then when Jesus comes along and says, this gospel shall be preached to all nations, all the peoples of the earth, that they might know that I am the Lord of the nations and that I am the King that God himself has anointed and set on high. And this is our task.